connotation and a piety has a more religious connotation as if it were coming from again from the West translating those terms into a in a religious way so I mean even a word like um, uh, well reverence is a little less religious to me than you know than worship um, or respectfulness maybe are, are there equivalent alternatives would you say um. Or is that uh, just generally? Uh, remember, there, there are, yeah. Roger and I translate the Xiaojing, which is usually translated the classic of filial piety. We translate it as the classic of family reverence. Family reverence. Family okay. reverence. And uh, the sense of revering the family, there is a, a sense of awe, that for, for, for me at least, and, and for Roger too, that accompanies reverence. Um, but it can stay definitely within the human realm. There might be yeah. a, a teacher of yours that you revere. You stand in awe of her. She was just such a remarkable person. She understood you so well. Uh, and she was able to, uh, seemed to understand all of the class very well. And you uh, revere her. Uh, that doesn't sound at all odd. It doesn't, it doesn't sound... Um, Overly humbling, he is, and we, we think it's better to be assertive and so on, not to humble yourself. But of course, the more assertive you are, the harder it is to get your ego out of the way to liberate the spirit. <laughs> so you know that's what you you have to come to terms with. A little bit of humbleness is good for all of us. Especially, I think it was Chester to say, especially for those of us who have a lot to be humble about. <laughs> 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 Piety does have the Christian overtones, for sure, which is why we didn't want to use that. Um, <coughs> there's another word, jing, for respect. Hmm. But it's respect in the sense it has the hand holding the stick, the little club, uh, on the right side of it. And that is, um, well, you hark back to it, and I forget which dialogue it's in. Socrates has a line, wherever there is reverence, there is fear. But it's not always where there's fear, it's their reverence. Um, I forget which dialogue that's from. But he means their reverence for the gods. <laughs> and that's, and there, there'll be an element of fear in that at all times. So then he wants to contrast it and say, but not every time there's you no know, fear, is it accompanied by reverence? Right. It isn't the fear, which I don't, see, I don't feel in the Chinese. The Chinese, the, it's a, the pictograph of Shao is simply a, a, a young person help assisting an old man to walk, an elderly person. In a few places, it's an elderly person with a cane, but in most of the cases, it's a picture of, of a young person underneath a graveyard. Um, and that's where the, but it is, we believe family reverence captures it most because it is something that goes along with family, with uh, blood kin in the first instance of, of, of the Analects at the time. It was blood. But again, that's not anything that you have to do if you're rethinking what to do with Confucius in the 21st century. Uh, it's, if you have a couple of gays, uh, getting married and raising some children, you're not going to have much in the way of similar blood, uh, but it doesn't mean you can't have the, uh, the same loving relationships and establish the similar traditions to pass on to the next generation. I have a question about translation. If I remember right, <coughs> the pictogram for woman was with the child, kind of kneeling, right. remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Meaning that was sort of a function of a role of a woman. Um, so when you're translating, well, here's the problem with translation, obviously, right? So is there a, a pictogram uh, that doesn't have a woman's role being as one who gives birth? Do you know what I mean? One of being? Uh, one who, you know, gives birth or has to have a child. Oh, oh, well, actually, no, the, the word you're thinking of is a word for good. It's mother and child together, woman and child. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh, the word for woman is a, actually it was also originally a picture of slave. But that's what I'm kind of remembering. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture of 
uh, someone without a head, as you know, who was typically the main difference, on her knees with her hands tied in front of her, bowing like that, is what the picture looks like. Um, Parking lot. <laughs> Should say Peking. They're going to think that what you're writing is saying parking lot. Peking <laughs> lot. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's the symbol for parking lot. Yeah, that's the, that's what oh, I'm thinking. Okay. So this is the trunk, no head, right. and on, on her knees, and, the and these are her arms crossed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, it went high at the front. Today it's written like this. And if you add the child, it's the word for good. Child used to be written like this. Huh. In swaddling clothes, arms raised up, ah, ah, pick me up, pick me up. <laughs> uh, it, it, the way it, it went. There are um, a lot of characters are simply made up of combinations of pictures. So, so if this is the, the older character for woman, what would be the character for slave? The same. Both. Both. It's kind of revealing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're and your point is? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking the problems of translation. You know, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Translation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, virtually no Chinese character has just one meaning. You have to fit, indeed, apart from context, it doesn't have a grammatical function. So it is contextual, basically? There are both. Yeah. It's an almost entirely analytic language. Right. The order does tend to be subject verb object, SVO. But um, there are one word complete sentences, and there are times when you, um, you have to figure out which is the noun and which is the verb. Now, if you see the word for mountain, unless you're a geologist, figure it out as a noun, not a verb. Mountains don't move much. I, if you're a geologist, well, it might, you might <laughs> want to mountain something. <laughs> but any, virtually any Chinese noun can also be a verb. Any verb can be kind of bound. And the gerund is, we were talking about that a little bit, is what it works. On a, um, I didn't mean to get you off on it. No, 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 it's, it, it's okay. It's, and it's important to think about because a lot of people We'll still want to say no. Translation is a science. It's not an art. There, and you don't have you don't have to interpret. You can just do the translation once you know your own language and the other. And mm -hmm. people like Roger and I said, no, that's just wrong. Yeah. There is yeah. no trans. You may think you're not interpreting, but you are interpreting. So it's not a question of whether to interpret when you translate it. Which interpretation do you want to give? Because then I was thinking, I don't know what the pictogram would be for family, but would it? Like the Republicans would have it, would that leave out people who were not, you know, male and female? I mean, no. The the, original, the, the picture for family cha is um, a pig under a roof. <laughs> the word for peace is also a woman under a roof. What's war? Wars, cross swords, lances, spears, uh, and different kinds of words for war, warfare, battle, combat. Uh, that get, get done in, in different ways. But no, they, oh, and the jaw is very important. Um, in English, I'd have to say, will every person, everyone now rise? Everybody get up, no, go to their speech. Uh, or, hello everyone, or good morning. Uh, in Chinese, it's ta cha hao, big family, hello. <laughs> big family, please stand up. <laughs> That's what it is. Da is big. Ja is family. That's what they all, that's the word that's always used. Da ja, everyone. What that's translated, of course. Hello, everyone. Da ja, hao. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, it's, it is always family. That's the under a roof. I can tell my husband that. <laughs> <laughs> Not his blanket. Uh, it also means yeah, prosperity. Blanket. If you've got a pig, you're prosperous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but it's, uh, okay, so. Sorry. Yeah, Carl? No, I was just going to because I appreciate that you did the. It didn't matter, or if you have uh, gays adopting, let's say, a child, then it be, it's not the blood that makes a family, right? So I, I was going to 
because this the idea of family that as it came up earlier made me sort of question well how are we defining family when it comes to family because uh, like for myself right my I don't see a big distinction between my friends and my family like so my my friends to me are family right? and and I revere them right so it's kind of an odd uh, when I, when I with the way we were using the word family earlier, didn't I didn't find that too appealing. But then afterwards, it sounded a lot more appealing. Like, uh, <laughs> so it was a, it was more appealing to me when when we're not tracing family as a as something like a father or mother or, or, or that sort of thing. Well, it is for I say now, two things. One is giving an account of what the kind of family that Confucius envisioned, envisaged, but then the way he construed it its applicability to the 21st century sensitivities and sensibilities. What, what can, how can we keep the insights that come from that uh, and make it something that is liberatory, I see, you know, take it out of the hands of the far right and put it among progressive people where I believe it belongs uh, and, and, and do that. So I, am, I, I say I don't know whether Confucius was homophobic or, or not. If, he was, it's too bad, I feel badly for him. Um, but we'll never know, I can't imagine that we've nothing, any evidence would ever show conclusively one way or the other. But it is, remember, everyone has to do it their own way. There might be some very traditional husband and wife teams. Mm -hmm. There might be some that's gonna have a complete role reversal, house husbands will have. Mm -hmm. There might be, I would assume that most future marriages, if they followed this path, would be negotiated as to how much would be, what, what kind, how work would be broken down, how the children would be raised, what kinds of things we wish to do, which parents are going to need our care first, or how much, all the things that are going on. And uh, again, it doesn't also have to be that every family can create their own rituals mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. and thereby establish traditions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the older the traditions are, the horrier they become, uh, but they can happen pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tradition in our family, all of our daughters and now a lot of our grandchildren, in wintertime, eat dinner by candlelight. Cheap candles, and even if they're just eating spaghettios or something, well, they'll eat the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> but give a dinner. And the reason for that is when I was in graduate school and our children were very, very small, we had a lot of very Spartan suppers. Mm -hmm very Spartan, but a grocery store very close to where we live, he got a couple of cases of candles, and he sold them to me for about a penny a piece. <laughs> and so I bought a lot of candles, and we eat our very, very Spartan food by candlelight every evening. In the wintertime, of course, Seattle didn't have much snow, but it did get dark pretty early. So it was that whole season, and my children just got used to Right. Eating dinner by candlelight, yeah. that, that's what Rosemonts do. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, my father hated eating by candlelight. It, first time Joanne cooked for my father, he lit the candles. He says, what's the matter, John? Don't you want me to see my food? <laughs> <laughs> my father's aesthetic sense and mine are very different. <laughs> but. That's what family, you know, and uh, different gay couples would start different family traditions. I Can I, since I teach literature, I'm always interested in the stories. So uh, uh, Confucius himself left his family, right, to travel around mm -hmm. and teach. And uh, so, how I don't know, how does that fit into what he's writing about filial loyalty? Well, no, he. Philosophers were not known for being very steady husbands. Yes, I'm saying. You know, Socrates was a stone cutter, but I don't think he gave Xantippe very much money to run the household. And he's one of the few that married. Aristotle did not have a spouse. Plato did not have a spouse. St. Thomas, uh, St. Augustine, obviously, I think I said this yesterday. Spinoza, Leibniz, uh, Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer. Marx was about the only one. Don't marry a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> and Socrates' wife wasn't too happy. She probably wasn't. And he wasn't a very good husband. No. Father, Marx. 
<laughs> yeah. lost children that they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, that's not to apologize. It is odd, but he doesn't know much about his father either. Indeed, his father might have been near to well. Um, I guess I thought somewhere along the line that his father, that he was illegitimate, I thought. He I might have been. The, the have been. legends just started coming, sprouting up so quickly and so contradictorily, we just don't know. For the making, 90% of what we can ascertain about the life of Confucius has to come from this book only. The first real biography of him wasn't done until the records of the grand historian, the history of Sima Qin. You probably heard the first dynastic <coughs> history of China, uh, the <coughs> Han Dynasty, 470, so 450 years after Confucius died. So we just don't know. So we just don't know. There's occasional references to, to, uh, to Con Confucius in another one of the classics, but they're very minor. Um, and what we do learn from the Book of Rituals, which is also the one I told you about, focusing on trying to remember what the ancestors looked like. Uh, it's part of a much larger book. There's also pages that go on tell you how you should bathe your grandparents' feet. Um, but that, that's, there's a lot of Confucius in there, but it's exactly the same as here, what you'd expect here. So whatever you're going to get in the way of biography, if you can't find some confirmation in the Analects, you can't rely on it. Hmm. Can't rely on it. I was, I was going to say all of this to go back a little bit to about families and values and what you talked about earlier um, about how those values can be ordered differently by different people. This isn't one of my favorites, but one that sort of called to me when you're talking. Um, it's 17.2. Um, the master said, human beings are similar in their natural tendencies, but vary greatly by virtue of their habits. And I feel like that was a very, when you were talking about that, I was like, oh, this yeah. one. Yes. Uh, you were right, 100%. That is what that one is, is about in that sense. Uh, <coughs> yeah, unfortunately, it came from the Korean War. The, um, the Chinese expression, she now, is, uh, really does translate precisely as brainwashing, hmm. uh, which the Ch Chinese were supposed to be doing to American soldiers and Marines in the Korean War, those they captured. Uh, and it, it is a precise translation of the expression, um, thought reform, then replaced it later on. But if you think about it, you can't get anyone to take on a whole new set of values. The only way I can get you to think twice about a value that you put very high is to find another one that we both share somewhere there. I put it up higher than you do, we have to, we, but at least we've got to have a basis to talk about. Mm. If we don't have the same values to begin with, what will we ever talk about? Mm -hmm. How could anyone ever change anyone else's mind? Uh, say yes. So we can say, do we both value security? Yes. Do we both value privacy? Okay. Which one should we apply to the NSA? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to give the NSA free reign? Why are you that scared? <coughs> And, and at least you have a discussion going, even if you don't convince. But the idea of a whole seven of values, I don't know where that would come from. Um, and, there's, and of course, it's also a way of dealing with, uh, I hope you can appreciate also that there's a chance of a more global discussion about ordering values when you start it with roles. That is, we've got to have some kind of global agreement on what might be minimally acceptable ethically. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have to take cultural variation into account. Mm -hmm. We need both. So what we might have is everybody has the concept of parents and children. Mm -hmm. There might be somewhat different ways that families are honored and revered in different cultures and within lots of limits, we can tolerate that. Mm -hmm. Different ways that children show their respect for their parents, different child rearing practices. Uh, within limits, we can live with that. Mm -hmm. and that does allow both for, we all agree, yeah, that fathers ought not to abuse children. Mm -hmm. Teachers ought not to lie to students, things like that. 
Amy, was that you with your hand up? Yeah, I was just, you know, as you were starting to say this, I was just thinking about, you know, what happens when different cultures kind of rank roles differently, you know, because you have cultures that rank women in their roles as women or their roles as mothers, right. you know, much lower than, than men or than fathers. And that's, you know, one mm -hmm. area where we start to have kind of these, you know, global, ethical, cultural differences. Okay. Um, uh, we're being called to lunch. Okay. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> <laughs> well, 